We're going to talk right now about rock curves, and I can't imagine a better way to explain this topic than by talking about Star Wars and the Force. Rock curves are primarily used in the evaluation of continuous variables. These are variables that can take any value over a defined range. This is going to include most lab tests you get. Although dichotomous variables, like mortality, can be assessed using logistic regression in rock curves, that's a bit more complicated and something we won't get into here. Creating and analyzing a rock curve allows you to do a handful of important things. Among the most important, it allows you to provide a single quantitative estimate of the diagnostic accuracy of a test. It also allows you to determine the cutoff for that test that maximizes both sensitivity and specificity. Now there are times when this may not be the most appropriate clinical cutoff, times when you may want to maximize sensitivity at the cost of specificity. Think about using a D-dimer in the evaluation of a pulmonary embolism. We want a highly sensitive test, but we're willing to sacrifice specificity to get it. Finally, rock curves allow a simple method of calculating interval likelihood ratios for our test. So, we're going to talk about rock curves in the setting of the Star Wars trilogy. And not the crappy trilogy, the good one. The one with Jar Jar Binks. Hopefully you all know what the Force is. The Force is what gives a Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Now the Force is stronger with some people than others. But how can you tell who is and who isn't going to be a powerful Jedi Master? Well, you could just assume that any whiny kid with a high-pitched voice wearing all black is probably strong with the Force, but we'd like to be more scientific than that. In the original trilogy, the Force was this nebulous, ethereal, mystical concept that you couldn't quite put your finger on. Fortunately, the newer trilogy came along and cleared up all our confusions. The Force, it turns out, is caused by midichlorians, microscopic organisms living inside all of us. Thank God Lucas had the wisdom to introduce a little science to replace all this spiritual mumbo-jumbo. So now we have a means of measuring one's potential for the Force using a simple blood test. But how accurately do midichlorian levels really predict who will go on to be a powerful Jedi Knight? Say we want to start a Jedi Academy and don't want to waste our time training candidates who have no chance, or little chance, of becoming a Jedi. Let's conduct an experiment to help us out. We'll take 100 potential Jedi Masters who have not yet begun their training. We'll check midichlorian levels on all of them, then subject them to 50 years of training. At the end of this 50 years, Two investigators blinded to midichlorian level results will independently evaluate our subjects and determine who is and who is not a Jedi Knight. Any disagreements will be resolved by a lightsaber battle. It just so happens that 50 subjects have become Jedis, while 50 have not. We then plot our results. On the left are the midichlorian levels for all of our Jedis, while the values on the right are for those who did not become Jedis. We can clearly see that midichlorian levels were, on the whole, higher for those who became Jedi Knights than for those who did not. But a couple of questions remain. First, can we quantify how accurate the midichlorian level really is? And second, what midichlorian level should we use as a cutoff if we want to determine who should and who should not be accepted to our Jedi Academy? Let's start with the cutoff of 2000. At this level, we see that every future Jedi will have a positive test. Hence, our true positive rate is 100%. On the other hand, we also see that all those not destined to be Jedis will also have a positive test. Hence, the false positive rate will also be 100%. If we instead chose a level of 20,000, then all of our non-Jedi group have a negative test, and hence the false positive rate is 0%. On the other hand, all of our Jedis also have a negative test, and hence the true positive rate is also 0%. We see that as we increase our cutoff level, we decrease our true positive rate, with more Jedis having negative tests, and also decrease our false positive rate, with more non-Jedis having a negative test. This is the trade-off we face between maximizing our true positive rate and minimizing our false positive rate. On visual inspection, it appears that the optimal cutoff is somewhere around 6,000 or 7,000, where we have only a handful of Jedis with a falsely negative test and a handful of non-Jedis with a falsely positive test. A rock curve will allow us to more accurately determine this optimal cutoff value. Here's another illustration of that give and take between true and false positive rates. A test result on the far left results in both high true positive and false positive rates. As that value increases, the true negative rate increases and hence the false positive rate decreases. However, beyond a certain value, the false negative rate also increases and hence the true positive rate decreases. We have to compromise on a single best value. To create a rock curve, we first calculate the true positive and false positive rates for various possible cutoff values for the midichlorian level. We then plot these values against one another. 
with the false positive rate on the x-axis and the true positive rate on the y-axis. We see that this generates a curve. Note that the false positive rate is equivalent to 1 minus the specificity, while the true positive rate is equivalent to the sensitivity. So how do we use this curve? The first thing we can do is calculate a quantitative estimate of the test diagnostic accuracy. This is the area under the curve. We see here four different possible rock curves. Rock curve D is a straight line along the 45 degree diagonal. This is a completely useless test. In the middle of the line, the sensitivity and specificity are both 50%, i.e. you might as well flip a coin. As you move up or down the line, you trade sensitivity for specificity at a one-to-one -one rate. The area under the curve here is 0.5, the area of a right triangle with sides one unit long. This is the smallest value possible, and hence the least accurate possible test. Rock curve D, on the other hand, has at its midpoint a sensitivity and specificity of 100%, or very close to it. This is therefore a perfect test. Its area under the curve is 1 times 1, or 1. This is the highest possible value and represents a perfect test. So as we can see, areas under the curve should have values between 0.5 and 1. The closer they are to 1, the better the test. The closer they are to 0.5, the worse the test. Curves A and B represent two other possible curves in the middle. They are neither perfect nor imperfect. As you can see, the area under the curve for B is greater than the area under the curve for A, and hence B is a more accurate test than A. Going back to our curve, we see that it's not perfect, but it's fairly accurate, with an area under the curve of 0 0.90. Leia is my sister. Your inside serves you well. We have to remember that very few tests are perfect, particularly continuous tests that have been dichotomized. The next question is this. What cutoff value should we choose to maximize both sensitivity and specificity? We start by drawing a line along the diagonal at 45 degrees. We then find the point on our rock curve that is the furthest distance possible from this 45 degree line. In this case, that happens to be a cutoff of 6,000. This value represents the cutoff that maximizes both sensitivity and specificity. That will not necessarily be the optimal cutoff in all clinical situations. Again, the D-dimer that we talked about earlier. The last thing we can do with rock curves is calculate interval likelihood ratios. Using a dichotomous cutoff does not always make the most sense. Imagine a patient with suspected appendicitis. If we consider a white blood cell count greater than 10,000 to be positive, does that mean that someone with a white blood cell count of 11,000 has the same probability of having appendicitis as someone with a white count of 18,000? Of course not. Interval likelihood ratios allow us to adjust our probability of disease based on various intervals rather than using a single cutoff. To calculate an interval likelihood ratio, we first choose our interval, in this case 6,000 to 12,000. We then calculate the slope of the line intercepting these two points on the rock curve by dividing the rise over the run. The value obtained is the likelihood ratio for a value within this interval. If you run the test and it comes up with a value in that interval, you can then apply that interval likelihood ratio to your pretest probability to obtain a post-test probability. Well, that's all I've got on rock curves for today. Thanks for listening in, and remember, the Force will be with you always.